you could introduce um, everyone who is going to be presenting from Team Copley, and Kim will swear you in. Okay, that's great. This is Jeff Hebert, uh, the Chief Financial Officer to my right. And over here is Dr. Don Dupuy, our uh, Chief Medical Officer, uh, and also uh, Kathy DeMars, our Board Chair, is also going to be with us, the four of us here. Oh, you're on mute, Kim. Kim, you have to press star six because I had to mute the audience earlier in the meeting. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Abigail. I forgot the star six. Um, can you just spell the doctor's last name for me, please? D U P U I S Dupuy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so would the four of you please raise your right hand? Do you swear the evidence you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. I do. I do. Thank you. Okay, so Joe, you can uh, begin the presentation whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, Appreciate the opportunity to present to you folks. We're going to be wearing masks and we'll be doing the uh, Karate Kid mask on, mask off every time somebody is speaking. So you'll notice that. Uh, anyways, we've got their requested agenda. We try to fulfill those needs as much as possible. We'll walk through that. Uh, I introduced the four members that are here. And if you go to slide four, just want to uh, just background about us, independent nonprofit critical access hospital, one of eight in the state. That's actually a pretty clean fact. Uh, service area is about 30,000 patients, 25 bed critical access hospital with about 1,900 admissions, 12,800 emergency department visits, 460 employees. And I'm just having a little bit of fun here. I have a parentheses. Um, how do you define employees? Well, it's actually 375 FTEs, 460 paychecks, which may be considered employees, 540 active staff who periodically get paychecks, not counting travelers. So I just bring that up because it's interesting in healthcare with so many of these statistics that we look at. What are we talking about? How well do we define that? Uh, next line, 176 members of the medical staff representing 27 specialties. They're not all active here. There's a refinement. We can go through a lot of discussion. Again, welcome to healthcare. Uh, the two facts that are correct, the very top, independent nonprofit critical access hospital, that's clean, clear. Everything below it is kind of can be muddy and open for interpretation. The last one's pretty correct too. So we're $67 million of net revenue. That's all correct and clean. 2.6% uh, of the state's oversight of the 14 hospitals. So if you go to the next slide, uh, I always like to put things into perspective in terms of our size and what we're doing. So on the left-hand side, you've got all the hospitals listed. The ones with a star represent those that are in, um, asked to be part of sustainability planning earlier this year. That was a concern born out of the bankruptcy of Springfield Hospital and looking at some of the financial indicators saying that there's some folks here that are fragile and we should be um, aware of their performance, again, because of the Springfield bankruptcy. Um, if you look at the pie chart, I did not pick the colors. You can blame Jeff. I have no idea how he came up with those. Anyways, um, we are 2.6% of a $2.6 billion budget. Um, again, there's uh, eight critical access hospitals. We're sort of small in relation to the rest of the system. Uh, and if you look at the next slide, this just shows you, uh, this is slide number six. Um, again, the eight critical access hospitals, uh, although we're about 57% of the hospitals, uh, that's eight out of 14, we're only 19, 20% of the actual spend. And the others are the, for lack of a better word, the tweeners, uh, the PPS hospitals, and then the University of Medical Center, which is both a PPS, but also gets additional reimbursement on the tertiary care side. So I always think this is helpful because the critical access hospitals have a very unique uh, reimbursement methodology for allowable costs through Medicare. 
Um, and so when we always talk about healthcare reform, it's, an, it's important to understand where we're all starting from. So next slide. <clears throat> when I look at past financial performance and where we are as an organization, this is kind of a sobering chart that I did uh, when I first got here. It shows us losing money four years in a row, each year a little bit more, some more dramatic than others. Certainly the swing from FY15 to 16 was dramatic and the swing from 17 to 18 was dramatic. Um, I like to look at these things and I like to look at comparisons and relativity. You know, how does this feel uh, relative to size and others and what's the comparison piece? Um, losing $2.3 million um, um, is a lot in FY19. It's a negative 3.4% operating margin. Uh, in comparison or relatively, relativity, if uh, UVM Medical Center and the network lost that same percentage amount, it would be $55 million, which I think would get people's attention. I know I watched a couple of WCAX broadcasts and I know they talked about 10 million or 15 and people were aghast, but uh, relatively for us, uh, a couple of years of losses of around three, almost three and a half percent Negative operating margins, a big deal. So thanks for that. Um, next page eight. Um, I guess I would have to describe this as a turnaround um, organization. Um, and uh, the way that's best described is that it's a financial recovery of a hospital that's been performing poorly for an extended period of time. Um, turnaround, you really first have to acknowledge the extent and understand the problems which we've been doing this chart is one of them that we look at run charts over time. Consider changes in management and even philosophy to sort of turn things around and develop a, and implement a problem solving strategy. So we're trying that, we're down the road. I've been the CEO here for only 10 months. Uh, Jeff, the CFO has only been here five months. Uh, we're working very hard to make sure that financially, um, we've got a sustainability list. Um, Unfortunately, I think uh, when you look at uh, who's most fragile, given all of the indicators, whether it's margin, cash, performance over time, unfortunately, I think we're that that next uh, on the list. I know there's uh, eight of them, I think six or eight in the sustainability program, but um, unfortunately, I think we probably are the one that is uh, next in that list. So uh, I just wanted to mention that. It's not great to say the word turnaround, but I don't know when you say it. Do you say it after you declare bankruptcy? Should you say it before? But it does require us to really look at our philosophy, our past, our management, you know, some of the decision making. So I wanted to just uh, mention that. I think Kathy wanted to make a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to say that we, we've got to turn the hospital around. Um, and it is painful to say we've been watching the, the figures for a couple of years now. And that's the reason we hired Joe. Um, we need him right now to turn us around, uh, to keep the hospital viable and part of the community. Um, we really do realize there's a lot of work to do, but we also feel like right now we have the right team in place uh, to make the turnaround happen. Um, thanks, Kathy. Anybody else, if they want to jump in, you guys, just let me know. Um, on page nine, um, we did a major, we've made some major changes. Some of them are small, some of them have been very significant. So we actually changed auditors. We've had the same auditors for 25 years, which is actually probably the longest engagement that an audit firm has had with anybody in the state of Vermont. But after 25 years, we said we need a new set of eyes. We want BKV. Um, they're quite large in 18 states, 40 offices. They have about 300 partners and principals. Um, so there's uh, references of six of them in Vermont. So we're happy to have them. They take care of give or take 180 critical access hospitals. So they're giving us good advice, both from a federal level, our own personal operations, how we're doing, and also knowing what Vermont's doing. So that's been helpful. Um, next slide, this is slide 10. Um, this is a quality slide and uh, wanted to talk about that because the financial turnaround um, is not part of a quality turnaround, and it's a big difference. I've presented this to the medical staff and others, and of course people can kind of be braced and say, a financial turnaround, that sounds horrible. We're not that bad. Uh, Quality-wise, we're great. We are actually in excellent shape, and Copley has enjoyed years, if not decades, of wonderful patient satisfaction, safety data, and um, 
it's important that we maybe talk about this. I know our um, chief medical officer, Dr. Dupuy, quality is close to what he believes in and in his heart. And um, I was gonna ask him to talk a little bit about Nesquip and some other aspects of quality. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, we certainly uh, agree with the mission of the Green Mountain Care Board that the uh, three most important features of the healthcare system are high quality, accessibility, and sustainability. Uh, speaking as a doctor and a patient, however, I would say that high quality is by far the most, uh, the most important of those three. And because you measure what you value, and if you can't measure it, you can't improve it, at Copley, we do a lot of measuring uh, of quality metrics. And the list on the left side of the slide is really just a very partial list uh, of the things that we look at all the time. I'd like to run through, through three quick examples if I could. Uh, the first one is the HCAP data, which is the score of patient satisfaction. It essentially measures how patients feel about their hospital stay. I'm not sure it's a, a quality measure exactly, but it certainly says a lot about how you practice uh, medicine. And for the last full year that we have data from mid 2018 to 19, 42% uh, of our surveys are returned and we lead the state. And that 84% of our patients would recommend us to family and friends. And that also leads the state. Uh, so we're certainly quite proud of that data. Uh, moving to readmission data. Uh, and this, would, this is from uh, the Green Mountain Care Board's BU HDDS uh, database looking at 30-day uh, all-cause readmissions. Um, for the last full year that we have data, March 19 through February 20, um, Copley's readmission rate is 38% lower than other critical access hospitals and 46% lower than other PBS uh, hospitals. And certainly readmission data is in fact a measure of quality and it really measures the overall quality that uh, your hospital provides both on the medical and surgical sides. Uh, relative to surgical quality, the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, NESQIP, run by the American College of Surgeons, is certainly the gold standard in actually measuring uh, quality outcomes. Uh, the, we've provided a, a couple charts here uh, to highlight uh, some of our data. Uh, this is looking for calendar year 19. Uh, what we've shown here are basically uh, observed data. So this is what actually happens to patients uh, our, our data is the blue line on the bottom, and the red line is the average of all NISQIP hospitals. And typical NISQIP hospitals have names like UVM and Dartmouth and MGH and Johns Hopkins and Cedar sinai and uh, you kind of get the point. Uh, mostly very good hospitals. So uh, at Copley for calendar year 19, our overall complication rate was 2.1% whereas the average rate at a Nesquip hospital was 13.5. Uh, for surgical site infections, uh, Copley's rate was 0.3%, and the national average was 2.1%. There is, there is a certain yeah, but factor to that, because this is not normalized data to uh, the preoperative risk of the patient or in uh, case mix, but, but Nesquip does account for that, and uh, they look at odds ratios. Uh, and for all complications for calendar year 19, our odds ratio with respect to the national average is 0 0.51, which means that your chance of having a complication at Copley, all things considered relative to the average NISCO hospital is a half. And our odds ratio for surgical site infections is 0 0.54, which basically tells the, the same story. These, and these are both statistically significant outliers in an exemplary uh, direction. Uh, so I, I think this sort of tells two stories. Uh, one is that uh, we do a pretty good job with quality, but I think even more important is that we're always looking at it and we measure it. And uh, we certainly believe that the healthcare system really ought to do as robust and comprehensive a job as possible at, at measuring quality. Great. Thanks, Don. Appreciate that. If we go to slide 11, um, wanted to take up some of our COVID time talking about quality. I think quality is really important, and uh, I hope that you know every year at least maybe we spend some time with the state just talking about hospital healthcare quality because that's important. The measures and monitors and things that we look at 
Um, so when we get into COVID, that's our website. Everybody's websites start to look the same. It's just kind of funny how all across America, every hospital is copying the same images and sort of putting a bunch of effort into uh, managing COVID and explaining it and trying to work through it. We immediately went into sort of an incident command mode, looked at uh, our charts and the stuff that we've learned years ago around incident command system um, training. And uh, we set up some teams, COVID response teams, CRT, immediately set one up in the hospital, CRT, CH. Uh, those folks met twice a day in the boardroom. A whole group of us had a team leader, managed roles and responsibilities. It was pretty manic. And I think we did a great job talking through the logic, what we know, don't know. In fact, we still meet, we're down to um, twice a month. And so um, that was very helpful. The CRT MV meeting, which was Morrisville, that was actually six organizations, the hospital, the Federal Qualified Health Center, um, Tamarack, which is a uh, private primary care practice, very large, uh, the Manor, which is a nursing home SNF, uh, our designated agency, the Royal County Mental Health Services, and uh, Memorial Home Health and Hospice Agency. So the six of us really came together and managed issues around policies, personal protective equipment, um, what's the latest, how are we dealing with staff, staff issues, how are we dealing with cutbacks. It became a very dynamic, tight group with uh, the CEOs pretty much all at the table um, every uh, twice a week, we were actually meeting three times a week, and then we went to twice a week. And, um, and then we also created CRT LV for Lamoille Valley, which uh, turned into a very large group. LASROC, of course, everybody likes a lot of initials. Uh, and that's about 26 local agencies and liaisons coming together to talk about the same issues around personal protective equipment, policies, staffing, what's coming down from the feds, the state, uh, grant money. So we, I think we did a good job of sort of facilitating and being a catalyst um, for the team and teamwork. So, yeah, and I just want to also say that I was part of this community collaborative and um, we really handled, I think, the work here pretty extraordinarily um, to have all these groups come together and work together. And we still are meeting. We're meeting monthly now as a group of the six bigger agencies in the community. So I think that was a real a real plus for this community and Copley sort of steerheaded that that whole process to get this group together. Um, but I also want to say the staff here did amazing work through the entire process also to help all of us in the community. Thanks. So uh, the next slide speaks to sort of testing. So when I look at sort of the three phases of what we're going through, and we're still in it, and that is the beginning was the PPE. What do we need? Ventilators, equipment. We still probably might have some of that as we get into the winter. The next one was sort of testing. How do you test? Test results. Who's testing? You know, we have the collection sites. The last one, which we still think about, is the vaccine, vaccine distribution. Who's going to get what? How do we manage that? What are the costs? So in the testing realm, we really didn't have any standing as a small critical access hospital to have access to PCR molecular testing. That became a challenge. Um, we did get an opportunity through Dr. Catherine Antley, who's a dermal pathologist uh, and practices in a few locations. She helped us uh, get uh, a relationship with Ray Biotech. Um, I always try to tell people sometimes it's relationships or friendships or just sort of chemistry that brings people together. You know, it's not always planned out, but we um, worked with Ray Biotech, who's got some really noted customers like Harvard, Data Farber, Emory University, you know, the CDC. And uh, we were sort of uh, working with them to at least administer this antibody test and um, talk about maybe its value, you know, we wanted to participate. And I think uh, Dr. Dupuy wants to comment on that and even the next slide. Yeah, thanks. Um, as everyone who's been uh, practicing medicine during this period has seen, things are, are novel and they change quickly uh, in the COVID world. And we think it's very important to be uh, innovative and, uh, and somewhat uh, aggressive in trying to do the best we can for our communities. And so we had the opportunity to do this antibody testing. And, and sort of the idea here was, is that there are two kinds of antibodies that can be uh, looked at. One is the IgM, which shows up earlier and is more response to an acute infection. And an IgG, 
which is the protective antibodies that uh, will hopefully give us prolonged conferred protection and be much of the source of uh, the vaccine success. Um, and so we, uh, we enlisted uh, our staff and community providers uh, who enthusiastically came in and got tested. Uh, we tested hundreds of folks. And uh, at the end of the day, um, it was hard to tell whether the test was uh, not quite ready for prime time or if uh, our prevalence was just so low here that we really didn't have enough COVID to detect often enough to really tell how well the test was made, the test worked. So uh, we're certainly glad we did it. Uh, we didn't we didn't have a breakthrough, but uh, we're sort of undeterred with uh, doing everything we can to provide uh, the optimal testing environment uh, for our community. As as many of you, I'm sure know that Vermont adopted a centralized testing strategy for uh, PCR, and uh, what that ends up leaving is a sizable discrepancy between the standards of care depending on how fast you can get the results back of testing. If uh, you go to a hospital that has real-time testing, you can know almost immediately uh, what's going on and act accordingly. Uh, the rest of us sometimes don't have tests returned for days and days, which complicates and changes medical care uh, drastically and basically leads to two standards of care for the state. Um, we've been working uh, with other hospitals around the state and we proposed uh, two things that the state uses its size and authority to source and procure testing equipment and supplies. And then when there is scarcity that the entire state has equal access to the limited supplies such that we either benefit or suffer together uh, and equally. Another thing that we're uh, also looking at now, we've approached a company called E25 Bio out of Cambridge who has the antigen spike protein test as a possible uh, screening test. So it wouldn't replace PCR by any stretch of the imagination, but it's potentially uh, cheap and fast. And uh, we're trying to talk them into doing a trial with us, much like the antibody trial. So on the next slide, slide 16, this is just a slide to tell you about some of the volume that we've seen with our COVID-19 PCR molecular testing. Um, Don didn't mention a couple of things, which I don't know, I, I figured I'd throw them in now. We, we've had the ability to do on-site PCR testing because we have an Abbott Gen X analyzer and we just need the little Cepheid plastic kits. I much like to describe them as maybe a pregnancy test. It's a little plastic kit that you use. We just don't have access to those. Uh, there's a few other hospitals that also have the Gen X Abbott analyzer. We just landed a Brionix analyzer out of New York. And so there's a company out of New York, I think some affiliation with Cornell. Um, that thing arrived. In fact, this morning, Don and I went to the lab and looked at it. So we actually have an analyzer and I'm going to get us, we're hopeful within a few, just two weeks, we're going to have that up and running. The engineers coming today, we're going to have a supply and be able to do on-site real-time PCR COVID-19 testing with a turnaround of around five to six hours, which is going to be a game changer for us in our community, in particular for the folks with the MV, the CRT MV group, because all of those providers, the nursing home, home health agency, we're going to be giving them preferential access and treatment. So if they've got issues with their staff, uh, the worst thing that can happen in the small hospitals or small communities, if you've got staffing issues or a provider that is out or a key staff member, uh, it's really been difficult whether you're following advice of seven day self quarantine or another test. So we've all been committed to supporting the team and we're going to be doing that. Um, very exciting. And I think we're going to be the, uh, the test for that in the state of Vermont. Isn't that right, Tom? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So um, we've done well. We got a lot of donations, the most masks. We have so many cloth masks knitted, uh, sewn, I'm sorry, by people, thousands, uh, gloves, equipment, uh, shields. Uh, Concept2 actually landed 500,000 masks out of China. Early on when this thing hit, their relationships were such that they actually secured 500,000 surgical masks. And uh, we were a benefactor of that as have been others, but that was a kind of interesting, more story. 
So um, next page, talking about uh, dollars, money, and all the anxiety that COVID wrought upon us. Um, this was a quick assessment. Uh, we had a bunch of hospitals all be asked, what do you think the change in net patient service revenue is going to be going forward? Uh, we were the biggest concern, biggest loser. I'm not sure the terminology, but we were very cautious and thought that literally we we're going to lose 70 percent of our revenue because of this. What we were looking at the, the numbers, some of the hospitals thought it would be in the 20s. Um, I'll tell you what happened as that unfolded. If you look at the next quick charts, this is number 18. We lost 61 percent of our gross revenue and charges. The next chart, our operating margin plummeted to negative 2.3 million. That was a huge problem. Next chart, inpatient admissions dropped 58 percent from 168 to 71. Next chart, our surgeries dropped 85% on the inpatient side from 60 down to nine. The outpatient surgeries dropped 62% from 109 to 42. And um, just wanted to share with you, this is a method that we use with both our finances as well as our operating statistics. We take a two year, one year look back for a fiscal year and the current fiscal year. And then we have a couple bars on the right that show you year to date performance. So it's been helpful. but. Uh, all the signs were that, yeah, we it, this is was horrible, and everybody sort of felt the black hole of dismay that enveloped everybody in the country. If you look at uh, emergency department visits, they dropped by 55 percent, um, and we are still sort of working through that issue. And uh, lastly, the next one, weekly gross revenue, that dropped by 71 percent. So we were collecting on average around. $2.75 million, and uh, we immediately plummeted into around the seven dollars $800,000 range. Um, so that was um, hard to figure out what the future was going to bring. Um, we immediately started a process of looking at the state estimates for where this was going to go. Best case, likely demand, and worst case, we plugged it against the, act against the actual, and probably by April 15th, we kind of got a good indication ourselves that this was not going to be as bad as people thought, thankfully. And the state, based upon a lot of efforts, communication, everybody being good stewards, abiding by policy, social distancing, et cetera. Um, as a state, we've kept, we kept it extremely tight. Um, and their estimates went to 6-2, uh, and that's where we sort of stopped the chart. But thankfully, um, we did well in that. And then for our community, we kept track of this from the beginning of time. We sort of peaked out in March 27th, not that it was a big peak, but if you look at the volume of cases uh, from March, um, they sort of tapered off and now and then we collect one and two. A couple of false positives that occurred, but that's a whole nother discussion about what's a false positive and how do you verify that. So this uh, COVID thing sort of settled down financially, sort of post initial COVID. We found that a lot of patients, a lot was going on. A lot of folks were just avoiding healthcare completely. Um, a couple things. One, they were initially told to avoid hospitals for fear of um, 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 you know, disrupting the hospital as it's demand for taking care of patients. So don't go to the hospital and give them an undue burden of your visits unless it's necessary. And then later that sort of evolved into people saying, well, don't go to the hospitals because you'll get COVID. <laughs> so there were two reasons, I think, nationally. And if you look at what happened uh, all throughout the world, um, a whole bunch of care was delayed and people literally having strokes, heart attacks, significant in conditions and not going to uh, health care hospitals. So we started a campaign. Um, don't put your health on hold. We actually got the six partners to all participate, which was great. Um, we didn't ask the nursing home because the nursing home, although they are part of the team, didn't want anybody to even think about visiting. Um, but that worked really well. And I know Kathy was part of that. And if you want to make a comment. Yeah, I, I was thinking that um, Kathy was very helpful in this for us, where some of us are smaller entities and we don't have marketing people and, and things like that. So for Copley to take the lead on this and include all of us in this was very helpful. And you'll notice at the bottom, um, all our logos are there and we even took turns moving them around so that it was totally fair, 
no one was you know in the lead per se we were all equal partners through that so it was it was very helpful as a community for copy to to take the lead on this also thanks kathy i want to just uh move on to some of the income statement slides just going to walk through some of the finances for us all right so we're on slide 30. first slide is the income statement and what we've given you is uh, we have 2020 projected, 2020 budget, and 2021 budget as well. <clears throat> On this slide, um, our projections, uh, it was kind of a very unique year, as you guys know. And uh, um, the projections that we put out there, um, you know, we just closed our July um, financials, and uh, it is on track. Um, but again, that is a projection. Moving into our net revenue, um, overall, you know, we asked our managers in a very short time to put together a budget. Um, they did it in a month. It was a, a really great team effort. Um, for that budget process, we gave them um, volumes that were, um, were pre-COVID, so it was October through uh, March. When we took a look at those, um, we were actually, as an organization, doing very well. We were in eight had a budgeted expectations but when we got the budget back from our managers we saw that uh, um, overall um, they only realized 95 to 97 percent of uh, um, of that increase looking at our payer mix um, we definitely uh, um, you know budgeted uh, um, you know uh, differently here um, more specifically when we get into the medicare um, payer mix um, this population continues to age and we continue to see that uh, um, we have a higher percentage of Medicare patients. We also increased uh, our payer mix in Medicaid and self-pay. Um, the reason for that is due to the economic conditions caused by the pandemic. And then uh, um, overall that came out of our commercial payer mix. Last was our rate increase. We, have, uh, we are requesting an 8% rate increase that totals about 5.4 million for the year, and 674,000 is uh, uh, represents one percent. So, looking at our payers specifically, um, Medicare. Um, one of the things that's special about Copley is we are a critical access hospital. Due to that status, um, we get cost-based reimbursement. Um, that is based on allowable costs. When we took a look at the increase in our cost per service unit. You know, we feel that uh, that is going up commensurate with our rate increase. So we realize the majority of the 8%. Right now, as an organization, Medicaid is unknown to us. So there's uh, um, no um, dollars in our budget due to the Medicaid 8% increase. And then for our commercials, um, overall, that varies based on, con um, on contract, but uh, um, we are uh, um, realizing the majority of that as well. Next slide is what I'm gonna call the other revenue COVID slide. Um, I apologize on this slide preparation. I really should have uh, grouped this into loans and into grants. I'm gonna take that opportunity to communicate that right now. Um, first being the loans um, overall for, um, we got Medicare advanced funding. That was 11 million, we received that in April. We then also got uh, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield about 2.3 million. Um, we got that in two monthly uh, installments, April and May. And then the final loan that we did receive in May was our PPP loan of about five million. Looking at our grants, the federal funds that we received, we received those in April and May from HHS. These were specifically granted to us to offset our revenue losses. That totaled about 5.8 million. The state also had a program out there called the Medicaid Retainer Program. You know, the conditions of that program was to continue operations of organizations. We actually got three disbursements in the months of April through May, and that was about 911,000. And then the others were uh, um, grants to offset expenses, and those totaled about 131,000. We received those April through June. Moving on to expenses, overall salaries and wages. We are seeing our FTEs increase um, by 6.3, of which um, we are seeing 4.3 of the FTE increase due to COVID specific. 
Um, these are screeners, food and nutrition and environmental service um, positions. Overall, this one is a, uh, um, a salary uh, that we can uh, um, tag through our budget process. And we're looking at an increase of about 200,000 that we're uh, um, you know, thinking this is for the long haul. This isn't a temporary thing. These are built into our budgets. Our benefits overall are going up about 5%. Our pharmaceuticals are going up 5.5 to 6.5%. This would have been actually higher for Topley. Um, and the reason uh, um, it wasn't um, is because this is our first year in a group purchasing, which can't that, uh, um, that inflationary increase. All right, moving to the change in charge request. When we take a look at it, again, just recommunicating, we're going for an 8% increase. That is overall worth uh, about 5.4 million for the full year. 1% is worth about 673,000. Taking a look at the, um, the financial pressures, what's uh, um, why we need to do the rate increase. For 2021, um, you know, Copley right now is budgeting a margin of about 0.56 of a percent, um, or um, in dollars, it's 439,000. Copley over uh, FY16 on a previous slide that Joe had uh, um, shown, you know, demonstrated for uh, fiscal years 16 through 19, we had uh, negative margins. We have always the inflationary concerns, um, those being labor those being travelers or contracted services, as well as pharmaceutical increases. And we are seeing payer mix, um, you know, shifts um, with uh, um, more towards our Medicare and Medicaid population. We need to, as an organization, get back to financial stability. The reason we definitely need to get there is to rebuild our cash reserves so that we're able to invest in our equipment and our infrastructure as well as to invest in the staff here at Copley and the community services that we offer. The next slide um, I wanted to go over with you is just looking at our, uh, this is slide 37, our um, increases over time that we've asked for and were received from the state. So the first set of columns is the five year look back. <clears throat> Copley's in blue. I've taken out the other hospitals names um, because I don't think that's relevant to this discussion. Um, five years, we average submitted was 2.94%. The average approved was 0.64%. Makes us the lowest average approved of any of the hospitals by a lot. Um, the highest was one at 4.54%. Uh, now, if you go back even 10 years, um, we asked for a 3.52 on average. We got 2.37. We were the second lowest. The lowest was 2.17. The highest was 5.5. That was their average approved over 10 years. And then if you look at the 15 year look back, again, we were the lowest of any hospital by far at 3.01%, um, significantly lower than, than anybody. Now, the highest was 5.99%. So, um, the discrepancy of 3% per year for 15 years has really put Copley, I think, in a really difficult position. Uh, I know over time there have been great efforts to reduce uh, the cost of care and keep our prices down. Um, and I think we've done that really well, but there's sort of a price to be paid for that. If you want to go to the next slide? This is that same slide and I talked about uh, the fact that we were the lowest of <coughs> two of the three categories in the 10 year category with the second lowest. Um, and if you look at the most recent 2018 all payer cost of care data that's uh, shown by uh, service area slash county, we are the lowest uh, coming in at 443 per member per month. But more importantly, if you look at the next slide we've got six years of that data collection methodology we are the lowest in the past five years and the sixth year we share a tie with chitman county by a dollar so pretty much i guess we're both lowest so just wanted to give that perspective of some of the data there's a lot of data out there and i think historically no matter how you slice it or who looks at it uh, Copley has been really good stewards of uh, the cost of healthcare as well as the rate increases. 
So if we look at the next slide, this is one that we took um, from the Greenmount Care Board. They were looking at uh, Northwest Medical Center mid-year rate request, happened to see this. Uh, and again, Copley's on the bottom at 0.6%, um, significantly down there. If we look at the next slide, this relates to that same presentation, compounded annual average increase over a 10 year period of time. Again, Copley is always there. It depends upon how you hold the chart. We are clearly the most lean, uh, you know, humble in our requests, uh, and yet we've been cut a lot too. So next slide, another interesting perspective. This is one, uh, I think, from Rutland in a presentation. Again, if you look at their data, I mean, all the data is relatively close. It's not exact, and why that happens, I don't know. But the five-year average of approved rates, we are negative. 1.3%, uh, which is kind of interesting. So we are off the chart in the wrong way. Um, and then lastly, a couple others, when you look at operating margins, I think Jeff referenced this, we're at the top four years in a row of negative operating margin. Um, and we know that Springfield, uh, again, is in bankruptcy. Grace Cottage, for some reason, always um, budgets a negative operating margin and I think has benevolent kind community members that make up that when that difference which is great but we're we're definitely one in the hurt locker and if you go to cash this is cah five-year data on days cash on hand we're five-year average of 80 days i think before we went into this uh, COVID experience we were at around 65 70 days um so in this particular time frame it shows um, 80 days the only a uh, person worse than us is Springfield. Again, they're in bankruptcy. And then you've got, uh, again, Grace Cottage down there. But it's it's uh, significant. You know, the operating margin, the days cash on hand. I could go into capital improvements and a bunch of others. I think Jeff wanted to mention the Optum study, which I wasn't around to um, know about that. But yeah. yeah. So to get the benchmark data, um, we did actually go to the uh, January 2019 report on financial health of Vermont critical access hospitals. You know, when we got in there, we, uh, you know, um, were able to see that one of the key indicators under liquidity was the day's cash on hand. Um, and we utilize those benchmarks. Uh, the two benchmarks that, uh, you know, we were able to get out of that study was the Vermont critical access median, median um, average as well as a, uh, an average um, from Optum, which uh, represented Northeast uh, um, CAHs. The point uh, um, on this is to get us to the, uh, um, to the Optum average of 93 days, uh, overall Copley would have to, uh, you know, basically squirrel away about 5.5 million. And to get us even close to the average for the other, um, you know, critical access hospitals, that would be up to 12 million that we'd have to put away. And additional cash savings. Jeff's going to go over some more balance sheet. Yeah, so I'm on uh, pages 45 and 46, our uh, balance sheet and cash flow statements. Again, on both of these, uh, um, our projection, you know, on 2020 budget and 2021 budget. Um, and again, our projections, um, you know, at least for the first month, uh, um, with August and September seem to be right on track. Um, you know, when I look at these two statements, one of the things that, uh, you know, we got to be very conscientious is going all the way back to the COVID other revenues, understanding how these loan paybacks, um, will, uh, um, be happening for Copley in the year 2021. The first one is our Medicare advance, um, loan. Um, expectations was, uh, um, after, um, you know, 121 days, um, you know, these were, uh, um, supposed to, uh, um, start to be paid back through our remittance advice. We're still waiting on that. And when we go out and try to understand what's going on right now, um, you know, you'll see that Congress is looking at these Medicare advance payments. So, uh, at this point we still have that, but in these schedules, we do have them, uh, um, being paid back by the end of 2021. The other loan that we had that I discussed earlier was the Blue Cross Blue Shield. That was 2.3 million. Um, that one had uh, pretty clear guidelines. Uh, they will be uh, taking back their monies in the months of October of this year, November and December in three monthly um, payments. 
And then at this time, you know, we are still um, waiting on hearing the final rules for our PPP loan. Um, and uh, until we get the clear understanding, if we um, qualify to um, have it turn into a grant, we are assuming that uh, that will be paid back by um, September as well. Service line adjustments. Um, overall, for Copley, um, we feel that uh, the services that we currently offer are appropriate for the community, so we have nothing to report uh, um, and changes on our service lines. So under um, sort of risks and opportunities, just three large categories. The risk going forward is certainly lingering COVID-19 concerns, um, and there's still a lot of speculation and discussion about personal protective equipment, testing methodologies. Um, there was a discussion a few weeks ago about gloves. So we're we're concerned about a number of things uh, going forward. That's a uh, risk that we can't really predict, although we're trying to be as prudent and cautious as possible. We are not squirreling away an undue amount of anything. We're trying to just sort of see how this unfolds. Staffing is always a risk and concern for us moving forward just because if we lose any key providers or key support staff or nurse managers or even billers or folks in the leadership team, it always creates instability. And so that's a risk for a small critical access hospital. I think all eight of us have that same concern. And then the sustainability issue. Um, we, we were chosen to be part of that group. I think we're probably the poster child of you know, one of the members that probably needs some more attention and help and understanding as to what's going on, given our uh, losses and the stresses that we've been under. Um, the next chart, I think I, Jeff gets me a lot of charts. I appreciate that. This is from the uh, Vermont Hospital Association. Uh, that risk of cash. This was a uh, time frame of around April 30th to May 4th. And, uh, you know, the two worst are um, Springfield, and Copley, you know, in this particular time frame, we're at like 35 days to zero. Springfield at 20. So cash is uh, cash is king for us. Uh, cash is a little bit of a challenge. With the opportunity side, there's always opportunity ongoing. We see a lot of that. We're just trying to get through the financial stressors to be able to afford to to have some opportunity to even invest, which is important, and look at opportunities. We're always looking at our clinical quality. Don references that, but we, we're pretty obsessed over providing excellent care. And uh, I think people travel far and wide to come to Copley, which is really an honor. Our orthopedics program in itself draws people from all over the state and then some. Um, and we've got a great surgical team and we've got uh, you know, great staff, extremely competent folks. So that's, uh, that's part of it, patient experience. It's important. That's why part of the decision-making process, although it's not entirely clinical, um, in the whole coordination of our care and services. I know even on the orthopedic side, we've been doing some outpatient hips and knees, and um, our our surgeons push themselves. <laughs> They're that good that they just push themselves to always do better, to refine, to you know, eke out improvements in small and in big ways. Uh, master facility planning is a big issue for us. We haven't had that in years, if not decades. We're trying to work through the process of looking at our campus, looking at all the investments and in buildings, infrastructure changes, improvements so that we're not spending money inappropriately or to find that five or 10 years down the road, we shouldn't have done that. So we have been uh, working on that. I think Kathy wants to make a comment. Right. Um, I just want to say that I've been at Memorial Home Health for over 25 years and we are neighbors to this facility. So I can tell you that I have seen the lack of work being done here or not being done. Um, it's been nice to see in the last couple months, just new roofs put on, some doors replaced, paving taken care of, a few trees planted. So to see those capital improvements happening has been good as a community and it's good for the neighborhood. Yeah, good. Um, so an opportunity is we continue to coordinate with our local um, folks here. So the hospital tends to be a bit of a hub, <clears throat> although we're really open to, to share, again, whether it's personal protective equipment for... So, so what was the what name was of the, the witness, witness that just that testified? testified? Oh, that was Kathy DeMars, the board chair of the hospital. And she's also 
um, the executive director of Lamoille Home Health and Hospice next door. Okay. Okay. I yep. thought you slipped in a uh, witness that hadn't uh, been sworn in yet. <laughs> Is my voice getting higher? I don't get to see here. I'm just seeing uh, you and um, Jeff. So go ahead. Okay. Thanks. Um, so just want to say that um, I think it's really imperative for us to work with these local organizations, again, the designated agencies, the private practitioners, um, the nursing home. It, it feels like we're really developing some teamwork. It feels like when we talk about healthcare reform or assisting each other with staffing, whether it's clinical staff or administrative staff, I, I feel like this is a uh, small little microcosm of what could happen in Vermont. I know we're a tiny part of the state, but if we can get coordinated, um, that's worth a lot, and we've been working on that. Um, Jeff wants to talk a little bit about capital. Okay, so we're on actually slide 51. Overall, our capital at the top just basically is a demonstration um, by year. Capital for many years, we um, unfortunately have been underfunding it uh, due to the uh, cash concerns we have here at Copley. For budget 21, we do have a uh, um, substantial need to uh, you know, get at capital. We have that set at 4.2 million. Some of our specific areas um, that we're looking at uh, um, definitely needing um, some capital improvements is a lot of needed upgraded IT infrastructure, and that's coming in at 688,000. We're also, uh, um, there's a category called ancillary. This is imaging lab and other diagnostic equipment, equipment here at Copley, and that has a, you know, a price tag of 687,000. And the last one that I'll just go over is uh, our nursing, which uh, um, includes our acute and swing units, and that's coming in at 345,000. Good, so um, we've got a lot of extra time. I think we're finishing up. Uh, wanted to just summarize by saying that um, I think over the many decades, Copley's done a really nice job and very modest in their requests. At this point, we'd love to get at least the average, or just a little bit above average, given the years of needing funding. Um, we do have a lot of operational program investments that we need to do. Um, hopefully, you get a sense that we are fragile. So if you're looking at that sustainability group and trying to figure out who needs a little bit of extra help, we do need some help to sort of work our way out of that. Uh, and we do try to deliver above average performance. But again, our cost, our, our cash is a concern, our operating margin. And so I hope there are some good questions and we can sort of talk about all of that. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Um, we're gonna start with Maureen Yusufer. Maureen. Uh, thanks. And first, uh, thank you for uh, the presentation. Thank you for everything you've been doing during this crisis. Um, it's really appreciated. Um, when you, just, just a couple things on some of the charts that you've gone through. When you talked about the PPP money and um, the assumption of having to pay that back, um, you know, it seems like the payroll protection program that, that you would be, um, that you would be qualified for that. And although when you reconcile it, you know, it's possible maybe you can't justify 100% of it, but you know, I, it seems to be very conservative to assume that you'd be paying back that $5 million. So I guess I just want to get a little more handle on why you think you'd have to pay that back, um, you know, because obviously that's separate from all the other funding that was received. Yeah, I'll jump in and then Jeff can jump in after. Um, I think the, uh, the, the federal government's response to COVID-19 has been dramatic and significant. Uh, I think many of us, particularly our audit firm and others, when they look at the potential audits that are going to happen or the realization of what can we afford as a country, I'm not sure. Early, earlier on, I would have said, yeah, I think the PPP monies are going to be forgiven, but nobody knows that. We've got an election. We might have a complete change in the White House. Um, and I think there's still this uh, reconciling as to how much money has been literally poured out, if not shoveled out into America. And uh, those that have accounting backgrounds asking questions like, how are we keeping track of this? How are we making sure that it's abiding by the rules and regulations? So my confidence in that becoming a grant has actually diminished over time. Um, 
but that but it's it's up for speculation. I don't know the answer. That's all I have. And Marie, I guess can I follow up on that? Sure. So there were rules of the game that were put out when you um, applied. And I think uh, a different way to ask you the question, is, Joe, is how much do you think you should get? Well, Kevin, in regards to the rules, uh, definitely they keep constantly changing. That's our concern. When we first they, um, applied for the PPP loan, um, they actually had an eight-week uh, window um, in regards to getting uh, all your employees back into the saddle. Um, I believe it was like almost a, um, a week after we received those monies and we turned that counter on, that they did move it uh, on to 24. Um, you know, we are hoping that, uh, you know, this uh, um, will be um, ultimately a grant opportunity. But until we know for sure, that's why we're treating it this way. I, I get the conservative approach, but it's just ironic that uh, it's $5 million and it's only uh, 500000 less than uh, what you show is what's needed to reach the uh, optimum target on your um, cash on hand or to look at it a different way. Um, if you look at... Uh, uh, 674,000 per percentage. If you multiply that times eight, I think it comes out to 5.4 million. So um, this is only um, $400,000 less than that if you were to have it forgiven. But that's just one way to look at it. And I, if I were in your shoes, I'd be presenting it exactly the same way. So thank you. And thank you, Maureen, for letting me to follow up on that. Oh, no problem. So can I just... Uh, um, it's hard. It's when you say, Kevin, how much do you think you need or deserve? Um, I think uh, we have worked tirelessly to apply for every grant that has come by. And uh, I know people would say that's a great thing that you've done. If there's a federal opportunity to bring yes. those dollars into Vermont. Joe, Joe I wasn't you. trying to um, insinuate that you didn't need or deserve it. I think you do. I was just trying to uh, rephrase the question and probably not very artfully so to ask you if you if you were being asked by the federal government, how much would you think, do you think you should be asking for? And obviously you'd be asking for the full amount. I, I would hope you would want me to do that, Ken. I would. Yes. Thank you. if you weren't, Joe, I'd be very upset with you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. And I'm gonna continue a little bit on the line, this um, line of questioning, which is really, if, the five million was forgiven, and if you knew it was going to be forgiven when you put your budget together, how would that have changed your budget proposal? Well, um, uh, Jeff can jump in. I, I would assume if it does get forgiven, we're going to let you know, and you guys are going to look at our budget and probably make an adjustment accordingly, given the fact that that is forgiven. That's what I would suggest you do. I haven't calculated that, but if we've got $5 million of additional net revenue, that would be extremely helpful for us. And I would think that'd be a windfall for the state and all of us and save money. But I don't have a dollar amount right now. Like what, what, you know, I don't know what that would do to the rate requests. So I apologize. Right, right. And, and I guess that's where I'm going. And I don't, um, you know, obviously we know, you know, you, you've done a lot of um, support showing where you've been and, and, and the history. And, you know, of course, we know there's a little more background to some of that history, but we understand, you know, that those are the uh, rate increases that you've received over the years. And, of course, it compounds. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to the place of saying, for instance, if you got it all, that you shouldn't get a rate increase. Um, However, we did have the opportunity this year to put in a COVID only rate increase. So, you know, so maybe it's possible we could, we would link some of that to, to this, not, not all of it, but you know, it could be something like that for the component. And the other piece related to the COVID only piece is you did show some uh, support of jobs that you need, you were hiring that were continuing on next year related to COVID. And just wondering why you didn't put any of your 8% request into a COVID piece only, not for the commercial rate, because um, you know you are one of the highest rate requests we have this year, so. Yeah, so with the, uh, uh, the COVID request, 
again, um, to communicate, uh, you know, FTEs, um, I can, you know, easily tag that and, you know, say that uh, here's the overall salary increases that we're expecting as well as with benefits. The other stuff uh, um, is really built into the budgets of our department managers, increased testing, which is not as easily acquirable um, to get out um, as well as to put in a time frame. So that's why we, um, we just didn't have that ability at this time to get that detail. Okay. There's things like the increased tests and maybe some inefficiencies in, in how, you know, how, how many patients you can accept and things like that. Those types of things could go into a COVID increase, uh, you know, with the hopes that in 2022, they would go away, right? That we wouldn't need some of the COVID piece. Who, who knows? But in, and if we needed it, maybe they would continue on, but there was, we would have that option to put that in there. Um, Okay, when you look at your your NPR, you were tracking um, like 8.4% ahead through February. And I guess first, can you talk a little bit to to that, you know, increase? Because you, you had a pretty big um, approved increase from your, 2000, your 2020 budget, I think it was over 6%. So you were tracking 8% above through February. Um, so can you talk about what was driving that? Yeah, so when we looked at this, we looked at it in many different ways. It's a, um, our volumes um, were definitely above budgeted expectations. The um, volumes in our surgical area, our ancillary testing across the board, we were seeing. Oops, I lost you. Yeah, you just froze, guys at uh, Copley. You may have to uh, log out and log back in. I don't know, but you're frozen. Yeah, we can't hear you at all. Uh, now you came back a little we lost you <laughs> sorry we saw that you guys froze up too so uh, we, okay. did you oh so you didn't hear anything that i said that's correct oh sorry oh. about that <laughs> um <laughs> all right i'll try um Overall, it was uh, um, it wasn't one specific key area. We were definitely uh, um, outperforming in our OR, but we were seeing those increases in our uh, um, ancillaries, our diagnostic imaging, our uh, um, lab testing, as well as you know um, meeting. Um, you know, we were just exceeding expectations um, throughout the organization. It wasn't one specific key area that uh, was just uh, out doing um, better than anything else. Okay. And that um, just just touch upon, I guess the the surgical area and um, and the volume there. I mean, uh, obviously you had had some personnel um, changes there, and that had brought on some declines. You know, in the in the last year, you know, are you back on track for where you think you need to be for surgeries for both? Uh, I guess more for 2021. What you're forecasting? Would you would you say you're kind of back on track to? where you would have been historically? Yeah, we, we think we uh, worked through the, the deficit that losing Dr. Huber uh, as a daily surgeon uh, provided. And uh, we do feel as though we're essentially uh, fully staffed and operating the OR at uh, significant uh, efficiency. Okay, great. That's good to hear. And I know you guys were forecasting that, but there was a little bit of uncertainty, you know, about whether you would have the staffing and capacity to be able to do that. So um, that's good to hear. Um, when you look, so so just getting back to the NPR, so you were about 8.4% ahead. And now in this budget, as you talked about, you're, you're looking at um, some declines against that trend. I think you were down 1.7 in inpatient, 3.7 in outpatient, 4.7 in clinic. But can you um, can you also give us that number related to budget, um, just so we have? You might not have it now. So I'm assuming you know from budget you're probably higher over volume. From where you were trending through February, you're lower. But one of the things we're tracking is is just kind of like where where are people. You know, in 2021, in their 2021 budget, where are they relative to their 2020 budget for um, what they're assuming for utilization? So if I could take the opportunity, I'd love to get that um, back yeah. to you guys. I'll write yeah. that down. Thank yeah, you. I can kind of like rough out a number. I mean, it's 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 above you know, it's above zero. <laughs> it's, not, it's above zero. It's above 100. You know, it's above 100. It's it's so so that's yeah. okay. Um, just looking at the 
the P&L and your margins, um, obviously you're still looking for a relatively low margin for 2021. And what can you tell us about any cost saving programs that you have? Um, you know, because clearly you've had a lot of financial challenges. You're going to continue to have those when you work on thin margins. And, um, you know, if, if you don't get the volume next year, we've seen what we've seen in the past is the expenses don't come down and then you, you know, hospitals lose money. And that's, you know, that, that one chart you showed where a lot of hospitals were losing money. One of the reasons for, you know, several of those hospitals is they had too high forecast to begin with. They didn't come in with their top line. They came in with all their expenses and more and they lost money. And so, you know, it's, it's really trying to make sure that the top line number you have is achievable as well as then what cost saving programs do you have? So that's a great question. Um, we do have an entirely new methodology of presenting finances uh, to the board, even to our staff and the providers, physicians, Pretty transparent about all that. Uh, we use run charts over time that cover two years by month. So we really do look at operational statistics as well as the financial statistics. So our controls and understanding what's going on so we're not chasing noise or being concerned about variation that's natural in the system. So if you look at ER volume visits and other stuff, that's actually helped us not run around with our hair on fire. So we do have a lot more controls and feedback in place. Um, we have actually made a lot of significant decisions. One of them is that there was a commitment that I inherited that we would get a new information system <clears throat> and go to Cerner and drop CPSI. We're one of the uh, oldest CPSI customers, probably in New England, if not in America. And um, there's that great lesson about uh, information systems. It's like a marriage. Uh, Half the problem is you, it's not always the other person, and you're probably more than 51% of the problem. So um, we've come to realize two things. One, that we can't afford to swap out our information system and start from scratch. Uh, you probably know if you've been around Vermont very long that most every hospital that estimates and even re-estimates how much it's gonna cost, they always undershoot, it costs more, it becomes a disaster. It ends up being millions and millions of dollars more, if not close to $10 million more. So we've realized one, we can't afford it. Two, we are a big part of the problem. So we're making a very concerted effort. Uh, we're preparing for a January 1st um, restart, reboot, recommitment to our vows. I'm just making jokes here, but uh, to actually invest in CPSI and make sure that we are using it to its full advantage. It's not a bad system. It's a pretty good system. So. Um, we're working on that. That should be saving us millions of dollars in expected capital that we talked about years ago. And we're trying to be very dynamic with the budget and all of what we do. So even an approved budget doesn't mean it's approved. So we actually say to folks, just because you got approved capital or labor or any issue, we're always looking at the organization's performance, our operating margin, how well we're controlling costs. And so um, getting through the budget process through our finance team is just the first step, but we're always looking at whether or not we can afford those FTEs or those changes. And if we do have an emergency <clears throat> and something urgent, we will go purchase that because sometimes we have not done that and we have to pay double if not triple because we never addressed a problem that should have just been quickly addressed. So we're always looking at that uh, approach. What can we afford? We're trying to manage labor over time. We'd like to reduce travelers. Um, we're looking at shifts. Um, people uh, ask to take time off uh, during common holidays so that we don't have staff around uh, being inefficient. So we're working through a number of issues. Uh, also the revenue cycle to make sure that we are collecting and getting credit for all the work that we're doing because uh, there are cases where uh, we're missing potential charges, reconciliation, sort of leaving money on the table because of the administrative back end. So it's a matter of uh, cost control, but also making sure that your operations are really tight. So, and Dr. Dupuy is raising his hand, so I assume he wants to say something. I, I hope that's what it means. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah thanks. So not, not being a finance guy, um, I sort of get baffled by the uh, the question about cost cutting. 
because all our supplies just keep getting more expensive. They don't get cheaper. And a hospital, mostly, uh, the people are the most expensive thing. And the people really don't get cheaper either. And we like all the other uh, hospitals in Vermont, uh, and it's a worse problem for uh, the critical access problems is because we're all very thin on staff. We all wear a lot of different hats. There's not a lot of extra people. So whenever you have to use travelers, uh, it's, it's very painful, both financially and just as an operational point of view. And so we have a couple programs here that, that we're working hard on cost containment with. We, we train our own uh, uh, surgical techs. We send them off to school and then they come back and have a work obligation. And we do the same thing with, uh, well, similar thing with nurses. Right now we have nine student nurses uh, up on the floor, uh, largely with the idea not only to provide more nurses for Vermont, but also so we can have more nurses and use less travelers. So uh, I think cost containment is a much better concept than cost cutting because it's you know, nearly impossible to cut the cost. Well, being a finance person, <laughs> I would look at it a little bit differently, which is, um, you know, there are always uh, cost saving opportunities and efficiencies that can be had. And, you know, we'll hear a bit about the low hanging fruit, you know, low hanging fruit has already been, you know, we've already got all the low hanging fruit, but there's, there's always something. And when times get tough, um, you know, we see people come up with new solutions or, or talk about um, the ability to save money and cut costs, not just by cutting salaries and things like that, by optimizing efficiencies, by by looking at your mix of services and um, you know understanding you know where where some of those drivers are. You know, looking at um, groups to purchase supplies and looking at different ways to get pharmacy. So I mean, I understand what you're saying, but there's you know, any any company I've ever been, there's there's always a target to improve gross margin and you know continue with cost savings and uh, um, you know so it's something I'm going to continue to ask every <laughs> every year and uh, and again it's it's not to say you no know, cut the people it's it's trying to say I mean you know I I don't know if you could say that uh, there's everything in your hospital is completely efficient, you know, and there aren't ways to save money. And, you know, we've brought in things even on some of the surgeries, right, where there's been reviews of surgical costs and the time for each each thing and, and waste of things being thrown out and, you know, how do you optimize that? So it's really just putting the challenge on of trying to say, you know, how, how do we try to keep some of these costs down because they get passed on to the consumer who can't afford it. So. Yeah, I would say, I'd say 100%. Um, and we, certainly with new management, uh, we've had a lot of new eyes looking at things in a different way. And we, we've been able to create quite a few efficiencies. But, and without being overly argumentative, I would say that, that certainly all those are they're asymptotic uh, over time. I mean, you can only cut so far and then you're efficient. Yeah, Maureen, one thing to the efficiency is um, that's why I'm really excited to uh, um, have the opportunity of having a new auditing firm, you know, actually uh, um, come in here, take a look at it. Again, it gets to the different uh, eyes looking at uh, different uh, processes. More importantly, we're also taking the opportunity to have this group look at our revenue cycle, make sure our flows and processes are working efficiently, as well as our patient access. Um, they'll be coming in and uh, uh, making sure that uh, you know, we are performing, um, you know, the right appropriate procedures to uh, register our patients from start to finish. So we are looking at it different ways. There's different exciting things going on. Um, BKD coming into this organization is one of those. Okay, great. Um, and I just have one other question, which is on your the gross to net reconciliation for your for your NPR. And um, uh, it was on slide 30, um, but Basically, you're showing, and I'm, I'm going to, whether you do it off the budget or the projection, your gross revenue was going up about $17 million from 125 to 141, you know, or 14%. But when you get down to the NPR, you're only, you're only 
um, reaping five million of that 17 million. And I know some of it's payer mix, some of it is, uh, you know, bad debt and free care are higher, but it, it does seem like maybe that's a little bit conservative. And it, it ties more to then, you know, your operating expense, which is up, you know, 7%. So your operating expenses are growing more than your NPR, but certainly less than your, your growth. So, you know, um, you know, here might be an area of opportunity, right? If, if your gross is going up by 14%, why aren't you retaining more when it gets to NPR? So then it would offset those expenses and you'd make more money on the bottom line. Yeah, and I agree, um, you know, and, you know, when we looked at it, we looked definitely closely, specifically at the uh, the budget analysis, the payer mix that was submitted. And, you know, we do see that the uh, payer mix is going down and we looked at it and it is, you know, unfortunately attributed to increases in our Medicare and our Medicaid payer mix and decreases um, as well as, you know, um, bad debt. Uh, we have, you know, recognized in the budget that, uh, you know, it's different times out there. It's a pandemic and a lot of people are unemployed. So there's a little bit in there as well. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Maureen. Now for Dr. Holmes, Jess. Great, well, thank you. Um, and again, I think we're all echoing each other here with, with thanks for all the work that you all have done during the crisis to protect your workers, to protect your community, the late hours, the long weekends, all of that. So, um, a genuine thank you for that. I also wanted to um, express my appreciation for your emphasis on quality in this presentation and in taking a data-driven approach to maintaining quality. The NISQIP data is is yeah. compelling. You've shared that before. And um, I guess I would love to see all the hospitals, uh, you know, becoming a member of that organization and having that uh, access to benchmarks. How much is that a year to become, to get that data to be a part of that? Do you have a sense? Um, Don can answer that, but I, I, I was told that years ago through an MVP process of um, giving back to the state that pretty much all the hospitals used to be on Nesquip. Nesquip, sorry, I, did I say it wrong? Yeah, Nesquip. I, I, years ago, yeah, all the hospitals used to be on Nesquip. And, uh, and in Maine, a large percentage of them are, and uh, Don can speak a little bit more to that too. Yeah, I, I don't remember the actual number uh, precisely, but it was about 40 when you consider both the feed paid to Nesquip and the uh, the half FT that we use to uh, as our abstractor. Okay. Um, all right. Well, so all right, and I wanted. I guess I was going to ask you about if there were any um, early insights from your new auditor. I think that's an interesting. Uh, approach to trying to, um, you know, think differently about your financial turnaround, but it sounds like it's a little bit too early. And I know you answered Maureen's questions at length, so I'm not going to go there, but I'm looking forward to this time next year hearing about what your auditor says um, yeah. about opportunities. Well, um, you know, um, our previous auditors, um, you know, uh, uh, they, they were a great firm and stuff, but some of the things that uh, um, we've already got the benefit of with uh, um, you know, looking at BKD, is they're experts in um, reimbursement, they're experts in cost reports, and obviously they're a very large uh, um, auditing firm. Some of the benefits that we're getting is understanding that we are capitalizing everything um, on our allowable costs. So we've been working closely with them, um, given that we're coming into the year end close, um, but uh, they've been very helpful. When we announced or asked that we needed to do a look at patient access and the patient access flow, they were really excited because one of the things that they said that uh, um, you know a lot of organizations need to do is to understand how you incorporate the uh, COVID screeners into that flow and into that process. And so they were like, uh, you know, um, really actually uh, very uh, beneficial. And the last thing that uh, I'm really looking forward to, you know, with BKD is, you know, when we started talking about doing what Joe called the uh, reboot of CPSI, i.e keeping the system, but making it more um, efficient in its table maintenance and uh, um, in its data capabilities. They were so, um, almost I heard a sigh of relief from them saying, we are so glad that you're not uh, um, deciding to go with a new EMR and uh, you know sticking with uh, your firm. All right. Uh, I, I noticed on the, uh, the BKD list of references, North Country is one of the references. Does that mean that you share the same auditor now? 
they're using that. You, so I'm assuming that. Yeah, so. I believe uh, they have uh, on their lead, if they're still with them, again, that slide is a little bit older and stuff, was a gentleman, um, first name Brian. Our lead will be different. Uh, it would be David Taylor. So they are, um, I do remember that from days of old. Well, the reason I asked is we just heard from, um, you know, from North Country that their auditor has an interesting software package or there was some mechanism by which they were able to do uh, estimate contribution margin by service line. And I was just actually occurred to me that maybe you would be able to do that too with BKD if it's the same auditor. So that's um, excellent. Something yeah. to look into, but it sounded like they had that capacity, which seems like a really helpful one when you're in a financial turnaround. Yes, thank you. Um, so, I, and I, you, you, Maureen touched on utilization, and I think we're all trying to get a sense of each hospital's assumptions around utilization uh, for next year, compared to budget, compared to projected, really trying to figure out what's the COVID effect. And I know you're gonna get back to us with actual numbers, but I'm curious just to hear more of the story of what you're expecting um, you know, there is some decline that you're expecting. And I'm wondering, are you thinking about that in relationship to the fact that there's more sanitizing that has to be done, that the, the work patient flow is going to be slowed down because you have to, you know, there's more uh, that needs to be done in between visits? Or is it patient fear of, you know, utilizing services? I'm just trying to get a little bit of a sense in your community um, what's behind some of those actual assumptions. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. It's certainly, you know, how do you do medical care in the time of COVID, and and still be anything like efficient uh, is yeah. difficult because the primary concern is is safety overwhelmingly, um, and, and you know the, the telehealth experience is actually kind of kind of interesting uh, about that. And in April, uh, we had three. You know, I better put my glasses on. Yeah, we had 300 total outpatient visits for the whole month, and a fully 60% of those were telehealth. Whereas in July, when things have more or less gotten back to normal, we had 1,300 visits, and, and only about 1% wow. were were from were from telehealth. So it, it's certainly a little more expensive to operate in in the time of COVID, but uh, you definitely can do it uh, efficiently because not everything is done serially like you don't screen a person and then they go in you can screen the next person while the next person's in so you just have to think through how all these things work and uh, as long as you're keeping your your eye on the ball of safety uh, we can get pretty close but yeah we definitely is going to be more expensive you have to do a lot more cleaning and so you need more people to clean and uh, certainly if we had a lot of COVID patients uh, in-house uh, that would be very tiring for the nursing, and we'd have to operate at uh, you know, lower patient ratios. Well, it's just been very interesting for us, I think, as a board to go from the rate review hearings where we were hearing about a lot of pent-up demand that the carriers were expecting to see in 2021 and to hear from hospitals that they're anticipating 90% of utilization or 95% of utilization or sometimes over 100% of utilization. So there's a lot of you know, just differences and assumptions, which completely make sense given the uncertainty of the situation. So just kind of trying to understand your perspective. And I know there's no crystal ball. So um, yeah. What is it? Yeah, there certainly still remains some you know, trepidation about seeking medical care uh, in the community. I, I'm sure you all saw the data that uh, over March, April and May, the cancer screening and children's vaccination rates went almost to zero. I mean, it was just it was just horrible. And although most of that has come back, I don't think all of it's come back yet. And, and it's, I don't know how to forecast that. Right. Yeah. I think nobody does. That's why we're seeing such variance in those forecasts. Um, so I would I, I would agree with Maureen. It would be great to see what the expenses for the four and a half or 4.3 FTEs for COVID are. And if you if there is a way to pull out any of the COVID related expenses for 2021, that would be helpful to us. Um, the the medical inflation slide, thank you for providing that because that's one of the areas of inquiry that I've been trying to understand over the course of the hospital budget process. And I'm wondering if on slide 35, um, you could just briefly talk a little bit about um, the benefits, 5% increase in benefits. That sounded high relative to other hospitals and I'm wondering what's driving that. 
Yeah, one of the um, specific benefits, and it's due to uh, um, utilization that we're seeing the increases, offering more plans is our dental um, you know, um, increase. The other one, um, the main one, the big one was uh, um, our health insurance, and we do have a 3% inflationary increase on that. Those two added together are getting us to our 5%. Got it. So even though utilization is projected to go lower, your health benefits are projected to go higher. Well, our health are going, you know, just inflationary 3%. Just inflationary. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, would it be possible to just give us, and not now, obviously, um, but submit it, it's just a weighted average of those components so we can get a sense of the overall medical inflation that you're anticipating? For the benefits, yes, absolutely. Or no, the whole thing, like compensation, non-salary, pharmaceutical. You don't have to do it now, obviously, but... You know, obviously, you know, as you've said, compensation is the largest part of your expense budget. So weighting that more heavily than, you know, utilities or pharmaceuticals. So just a weighted average of what your medical overall medical inflation would be. Can I, uh, um, you know, we've been listening, you know, in on this oh. is kind of a unique forum. Um, so it's very easy to turn it on. <laughs> and eavesdropping. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And eavesdropping. Uh, so we did, uh, you know, uh, I've heard that common theme. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when we take a look at our salaries, uh, you know, our contracted services, our benefits, as a percent of total expenses, that's coming in at 58% for uh, um, Copley. Okay. When we take a look at our medical supplies. Now, the thing with medical supplies, uh, it's how you, uh, you know, um, identify or define what a medical supply is. These are medical supplies that are chargeable as well as non-chargeable in our budgets. Those are coming in at 14% of our total expenses. Okay. And then when we move down to the drugs, um, the oncology drugs and drugs, um, those are coming in about 6% of our total expenses. Okay. That gives a lot of context. Thank you. Yep. Um, you, you said something interesting, and I, I wanted to hear a little bit more about this. The 8% increase in charge, you're expecting the majority of that to flow through in Medicare um, via the cost report. And that seems a little bit different than what we've heard in some of the other hospitals. So I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit to that. Yeah. And so the cost reports, you know, they ebb and flow, they go up and down, you know, um, but overall, if uh, on the cost per unit on a cost report, if it increases, you know, um, at 8%, um, that then would, uh, um, you would basically, you know, net your full 8% rate increase, because for our patients, it's a cost to charge ratio that they utilize. And so then you would be able to capitalize on that. However, if you know, um, if that cost report were to see the uh, service unit cost go down and you had an 8%, it would be going in the other direction. So when we take a look at our budgets, that's how we look at it is to make sure that that cost to charge ratio is going up commensurate with our rate increase. Okay. So you wouldn't, for example, be expecting any cost shift due to Medicare next year in that component? We, not in that component, no. That component, yeah. Okay. Um, and lastly, I thought there was an interesting comment in the narrative uh, around that 8% uh, charge. It was Copley uses these rates as a basis for discussion with our commercial payers, as a basis for our discussion. So I'm wondering if you can tell me from your perspective how those conversations go. And if you don't get the full rate, the full charge that you're asking, how do you adjust your expenses downward? What are you going to trim if you don't get, let's just say the board gave you 8% but the commercial payers in their negotiations don't. Uh, how do you then adjust your expenses downward and how do those conversations go? Okay, so again, our commercial payers are always, you know, I just actually got a call today, you know, saying that they wanted to uh, look at them. A lot of the contracts actually, uh, you know, have built into them the Green Mountain Care Board aspects of the rate increase, you know, they talk about it and stuff. Um, you know, so again, it goes back to what Joe said, you know, nothing is guaranteed, it's a budget. And so, you know, if we need to, if we need to look at, you know, hey, of those, you know, um, 6.8 FTEs, we have to look at them because we didn't get the full, that's how we go back and we, you know, adjust it. Nothing's ever guaranteed, you know, it's a budget and we have to, you know, um, basically, you know, um, manage accordingly to that budget as well as to what actually is happening. Okay, those are all my questions. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I, I just wanted to comment, Jessica, on the uh, BKD slide of those other hospitals in Vermont. Those yeah. are just hospitals that have used BKD over the years. They're references, but they're not actually 
potentially the not current clients with BKB. Okay. We don't know if those are, you know what I mean? But they have used them in the past. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Jess. Now we're going to move to board member lunch. Robin. Thank you. Um, I only have a couple of questions because uh, many of my questions have already been answered. One of the benefits of going towards the end. Um, I, I thought it was very interesting that in your telehealth experience, um, you, you mentioned you were around 60% of outpatient visits, which seemed pretty standard for a lot of what the other hospitals are saying, but you've now gone down to 1%, which seems a lot lower than other hospitals. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you think is driving the telehealth use or lack thereof currently and how you see that developing in the future. Well, I, I think it's because most of our outpatient clinics are essentially surgical. We don't we don't have any primary care. Uh, the primary care partners we have in the community, we talk to them. They're still doing quite a bit of telehealth. And yeah. uh, it's and it's just the nature of the business in surgery that you got to look at things and touch things to really do the job appropriately. And and I think it's it's just that. And uh, and it's probably you know the relationship of being in front of your surgeon is probably a little different than uh, if you're having cholesterol medication adjusted. Sure. I, mean, I don't really yeah, know that because I don't adjust cholesterol medication, but, <laughs> but I, sus I suspect that's the case. That makes sense to me. Um, I I suspected that might have been a root cause, but I didn't want to assume. Um, in terms of then, my other question is relating to travelers. Um, could you and locums? Can you talk a little bit about where you were at pre-COVID, how that progressed through COVID, and where you expect to be moving forward? So, well, uh, Jeff can jump in. I, I don't think we have enough detailed information given the time frame that we've been here to actually understand and appreciate the travelers' uh, expense. It's not one that I appreciate. I. I know know that folks have needed them because of COVID and even more so because of some of the scheduling problems with students that we're coming into. But um, it's best if we could really pare down the travelers as much as possible. If you want to talk about a cost-saving idea that Maureen was sort of talking about earlier, uh, I've always dreamed, like, why doesn't Vermont have its own uh, uh, traveling company? Why doesn't the state endorse you know, a hospital maybe like Copley starting a traveling organization. And, uh, you know, we could export travelers all over the country because we pick up travelers from Texas, Louisiana, Minnesota. I mean, it's kind of an interesting, profitable venture that every hospital in the state of Vermont utilizes. I don't know why people wouldn't want to live in Vermont and then travel to Chicago, et cetera. So if we ever figure that out, I'll be looking for your endorsement. Um, they are expensive. We're not happy about them. It'd be great if we could um, um, have zero travelers, but uh, on the surgery side, things get very complicated with scrub nurses and, and techs and so forth. Um, that's probably where most of them are for us, but I'm not, not really happy about it. They do a great job. They're really nice people, but it just bothers me the expense and the profit margin that goes to those for-profit companies that are not based in Vermont. I don't know why New England or I don't I don't know between Dartmouth and UVM Medical Center why they don't have a traveling arm. I'm going to start that though. That's just we can write that down. And so, uh, do you know about how many you have currently? I don't. I don't know. Uh, I don't. We don't know that. Do you want us to get that to you? That would be great, just as a comparison. And it makes sense that you might be, quite frankly, a little on the higher side given the surgical focus. Yeah. Um, but we, we did see actually a number of hospitals get to zero travelers over COVID yep. time period. Yep. Um, and some of them are saying they think they can stay there. So that was heartening. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that's all my questions. I think everything else has been asked. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And next we're going to move to board member Pelham. Tom. Thank you, Kevin. And thank my fellow board members who went before me who makes this uh, easier being near the, the end and I'll be very careful not to talk about cost cutting. I'll call talk about cost incisions. How's that? Okay. Yeah, I'll try to use your language. Um, so my first question has uh, been covered a little bit um, 
it's in the arena of bad debt and free care. And I'm just seeing that uh, 2021 is a, on a combined basis is a 59% uh, increase over 2020 budget, which seems pretty big. And that 59% that, that is a combination of your 48.5% and your 87.5% you know, on your uh, operating statement. So, uh, but 59% seems steep to me. Um, if you could uh, uh, dig into that just a few, you know, for, with a few few more sentences. Yeah, a few more sentences. In addition to us, you know, shifting to Medicare and Medicaid, we are uh, on, you know, understanding or we did build in that there would be shifting to uh, um, the private pay um, patients. We also um, right now um, feel that that, uh, um, that population um, will be growing. Um, and we did build that into our budgets, um, at least for the next year. Um, we're hoping that, uh, you know, once everybody's able to get back to work, um, we'll see that come down. But right now, our current experience, we are seeing that those numbers are going up and that's what we put in the budget. Okay. Um, looking at your, the COVID-19 grant funding, um, you referenced that you got uh, $5.8 million in federal funds and you booked $4.7 million of it in, uh, 2020. And so that leaves a balance of a little over a million bucks. And you didn't uh, profile that on the COVID line on your income statement. So is that just something that's fallen to reserve and just sitting there for 2021? And uh, if it that is so, um, one other hospital kind of, you know, let that fall to their reserves. And but they're also worried that they might not be eligible for it. So it's, uh, you know, they're, they're, um, they're being cautious uh, in terms of spending the, the full amount because they think the president can change and the Congress can change and 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 uh, could, could make things a, a little bit more miserable. So, so that so uh, where is that one point that that additional million dollars in, in federal funds? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a great question. Um, and uh, it's one that, uh, um, you know, we're honestly at this point, uh, we are working with BKD um, quite closely to get the final regulations. Um, you know, when these monies first came out, the uh, HHS monies, you know, they were communicated that they were for uh, um, revenue losses. But one of the things that uh, um, everybody kind of was throwing the uh, red flag up, well, how does that impact your cost reports? You know, what is it going to, you know, mean? We've been learning consistently each month um, a little bit more about these monies. Um, you know, um, we did finally learn um, just actually um, about two weeks ago that the HHS monies aren't going to be touched by the cost report. Uh, you know, Medicare has already communicated that, uh, you know, that those will not be factored into it. So it comes down to what you were communicating from the other hospital. We are just trying to learn, you know, um, what the, uh, the regulations are. And at this point, it is, you know, in our, um, you know, on our balance sheet as reserved. Okay, makes sense to me. Um, the, Medi the Medicaid number um, uh, in NPR is up 23.9%. You say in your slides, in your narrative, that you didn't uh, budget for any Medicaid increase on a rate. Um, so is that all um, uh, volume driven? That, that is all volume driven. My apologies. Yeah, that is all volume driven. Um, you know, we're figuring that uh, um, and we are starting to see it now that, uh, you know, at least for this upcoming year, we feel that uh, the Medicaid uh, paramix will increase. Mm -hmm. So so if that's what that's a volume up. But then in terms of your uh, inpatient volumes down 1.7 percent, outpatient services down 3.7 percent, clinic visits down 4.7. It sounds like a little bit that the Medicaid's kind of going against the tide. It's going against the tide, but uh, unfortunately, if you take a look at the commercial numbers, that's where the payer mix is shifting. It's coming out of the commercial. It's going yep. into, you know, the Medicare due to the aging population, yep. and it's going into Medicaid and self-pay. Yep. So thinking about uh, the, the commercial, um, do, do you have any, uh, certainly you wouldn't take it to the bank, but um, a lot of people I know up in Stowe are saying, boy, the number of out-of-state plates we see around here and uh, people are coming, you know, look, and real estate values are going up, et cetera. Do you, do you think rather that it could, could go the other way, given the pandemic, that, that the 
Medicaid population will be somewhat, if it is rising, somewhat you know offset by second homers uh, deciding to uh, reside in the SO area? I really don't know how to answer that one. Rachel. Yeah, I, I, it's a good question. There's a lot of speculation. People always complain about the out-of-state cars. I don't know. If they see one New York plate, I think they count it as three. I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I, I've heard that real estate is very hot in Stowe and in other parts of uh, rural America. But we haven't seen it yet. We, we haven't budgeted that. It's, who knows what the economy is going to do? I mean, I, I listen to a lot of Bloomberg news. These people are all predicting the second drop, the second, you know, big giant drop in the stock market. You know, we're going to have a hangover again. I just stopped listening. So I, I don't I don't know anything about that till I see it happen. But you are seeing increases in, in, in Medicaid caseloads and Medicare caseloads. Yes. 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 That's on the ground. Yes. Okay. Um, the provider tax, it looks like, uh, you know, uh, relative to your uh, 2020 uh, projection of uh, in 21 years, it looks like a six, six and a half percent increase. The rate is six percent. Is is that just, um, you know, is, is, so, so I guess I'm asking is, is why are you budgeting that at six and a half percent? over the best number you know now for 2020 in 2021? That was a number that was supplied by the state of Vermont, and that is the number that we inputted into our budget. Right. For, so that's the number that the state gave you for, uh, um, tw uh, for the tax that they're asking of you in 2021. Yes, 2020. our state fiscal year 2021, yes. Hmm. Um, other than that, uh, it sounds like your staffing issues that, you know, you've, you've talked about before, you know, you've brought that into a soft landing, um, but you still do cite it as a risk. Are there any other of your, your key money-making staff, uh, you know, talking about retirement or leaving or, um, well, we, we have that all the time, you know, I'm not sure how much I want that on record or played over again yeah. by folks at home. It's kind of, you know, just sort of personnel issues. So I think everybody has that. We've got our fair share of people that are close to retirement or should retire or interested in retiring. And when somebody gets, gets struck by disease or accident or, you know, that is, you can't predict those things. Uh, we did have a very significant orthopedic surgeon two years ago come down with an issue, right. it, it, it's hard to predict that. So, you know, it's not like I, we have a reserve for unexpected illness by a key provider. I'm not sure if we could do that. That's probably not legal, is it, Jeff? I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not sure about that, but sure. it weighs over us because we're a small organization. So anytime you're a small organization, people really have to pitch in, be flexible, take other shifts, be cross-trained. I mean, yeah. it is a lot more difficult when you're dealing with a so that access hospital. So that is a constant risk. It's not just a risk that, you know, on your sheet you had it as a risk, but that's just a constant risk. It's always there. It's a constant anxiety, yes. You know. So on another issue, we the board approved a, a CON for an entity called Silver Pines, um, which is a 32-bed medically supervised uh, withdrawal treatment center in Stowe. Have they been in touch with you at all? Are you I am aware of that? that. It's the first time I've heard of it right now. Is that recent? That just happened? Uh, within the last three or four months. Hmm. So nobody at the table. We're all kind of surprised. It's okay. at the former Hockey Academy, Joe. Okay, yeah, I know what that is. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Nobody's ever even contacted us. We've never had any discussions in the ER nobody's even we're all looking around the well, medical director nobody home health agency nobody so well, thanks for that tip I appreciate it <laughs> Rob, Rob, Robin and I thought that your ears would be ringing <laughs> well, we, we, we were talking about we were talking about your ER um, yeah. so anyhow those are my questions thank you yeah, thank, thanks Tom so um, you talked about uh, the different forms of uh, 
grant funding that you were eligible for. Um, you didn't mention anything about uh, the state CRF or FEMA. Are you applying to either one of those? Yeah, so by the time that we had, uh, um, you know, supplied our budgets, uh, you know, we were still in the process of uh, filling out the FEMA grant. Um, that could, did get uh, submitted uh, um, last week or two weeks ago for us. Um, we also um, did meet the How deadline. How much was that for, Jeff? Uh, that is uh, two parter. Um, we requested 120,000. Um, and then when we get another piece of machinery, which uh, we were building into it, it could go up to 180,000. Okay. And for the uh, state 275, um, we did fill out all the paperwork um, for that. And we're just waiting to hear again, you know, I've heard a lot of questions like, you know, how much did you request? And that's not the type of grant that it is. It's they're going to uh, kind of communicate back to us. But the FEMA is strictly a, a swap for a capital uh, purchase, correct? The FEMA is uh, um, it's a two parter. The second part, the uh, um, the difference be um, you know the sixty thousand is a piece of capital. The other pieces are direct offsets to expenses over time. PP and E. Okay. Great. I think my colleagues did such a, a good job and you you guys did such a good job in your presentation that that's all that I have for questions. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to the healthcare advocate, Mike Fisher. Mike, are you on? Eric, uh, you're muted. <clears throat> Still muted, Eric. Start Am I on you there you go. There you go. Wow, this is embarrassing. I am. <laughs> um, so I just have three quick clarifications, questions, and just one. I was wondering if you could talk about what's driving the 2020B to 2021B uh, change in free care and bad debt. So I'm guessing that's partially due to the payer mix, but I was wondering if you could uh, expound on that a bit. Yeah, again, it's our payer mix. It's uh, um, based on you know um, the conditions that we're experiencing now, as well as the continued conditions that uh, um, you know we're expecting to see into the future. You know, um, we do have a substantial population up here that are unemployed. And we don't see that, uh, you know, um, in the, you know, um, immediate future that rectifying itself, and that's the reasons for the increases. Okay, that's helpful. Um, so, um, I just want to, I want to ask you about uh, the response to uh, the HCA's question um, about reimbursement rates by individual commercial payers. Um, so the answers to those questions kind of fell in a few categories. Some uh, hospitals were able to break it out. Um, others responded that they weren't able to break it out due to legal restrictions or contractual restrictions. Um, some others said they just didn't collect data at that level of granularity. Um, and then and you and a few other hospitals just you gave us the overarching category of commercial. Could you just explain, like, I'm just trying to understand why, why that category? So is it due to data issues, contractual restrictions, or what's, what, what, like, what's causing that? Yeah, um, you know, I don't feel that uh, um, getting it down to additional detailed data is uh, a limitation here at Copley. Um, we can definitely do that and, uh, you know, get it down to different categories. The thing is, is I guess you, uh, if you could give us more clarification on categories, there's a lot of different ways that we can dig into the data and it's just getting, you know, um, which payers or which payer groups would you like to see? Sure, I'll, I can report that. So we did have a table in that question with individual payers um, listed out. So I guess I was a little confused with just yeah. the commercial response. Um, and perhaps not surprisingly uh, for me, I want to uh, echo board member Holmes's comments that it sounds like you guys are doing an excellent job uh, looking at quality metrics. Um, and I wanted to really, because I think it's important for all Vermont hospitals, talk a little bit, you know, it's not just measuring things, which is of course necessary, but also how you're using that data or information and you know, translating that into um, 
changes in individual and uh, organizational behavior. So I was wondering if you could give an example or two about how you're using your analytics to drive change. Yeah, probably probably the best one is the uh, uh, antibiotic uh, stewardship uh, program that that unfortunately the, the state ended the funding for. Uh, but but certainly Copeland, I think the other hospitals are mostly going forward with it. And and the problem was to uh, consolidate antibiotic usage uh, in such a way that you get away from drugs with unfavorable uh, side effect profiles and had we're, we're getting uh, higher degrees of resistance. Uh, some drugs we just really, we can't afford to be resistant. And uh, as, as it turns out, uh, most of the drugs that you tend to uh, want to move toward turn out to be basically older and much less expensive drugs, but they're really just as good. But people sort of got into usage habits that are maybe a little different. And so we looked very carefully at, at what our actual usage was. Uh, and we put some time and effort into that. And then we decided what we wanted. And we just kept telling everyone what they were doing and what the goal was. And then slowly over the three years, we had dramatic in improvements, the use, particularly the use of the fluoroquinolones and uh, pepericillin uh, went down dramatically. And uh, also we used safer, cheaper drugs. And uh, obviously it hasn't uh, decreased uh, the effectiveness of our medical care at all. So that, that would probably be the, you know, the, the prime example of how that really that really works. I mean, there's a very tight coupling to measuring, publishing, and improvement. Thank you for that. That's all of our questions. Thank you, Eric. At this time, I'm going to open it up for public comment on the Copley Hospital budget. Um, is there any public comment? Remember to unmute yourself if you are on your computer or hit star six. Is there any public comment? Hearing none, I wish to thank uh, Team Copley for their presentation. And as other board members uh, have mentioned, but I, I think it uh, bears mentioning again, we're very grateful for all the incredible hours and the great work that was put into addressing this crisis that's in front of us. And also, I want to thank you for not being afraid to think outside of the box um, by at least attempting the serology, even though um, it didn't have the type of results that many people had hoped for. Um, but at the same time, um, somebody has to be willing to think differently. And I know that uh, um, you often hear of that thinking differently at Copley and and uh, that's a good thing. So um, thank you for your budget presentation and um, have a great rest of the day. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Do you need a motion? Yes. I move to adjourn. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kim.